We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this session, which is focused on the AI regulation in Europe. Um, the whole title is Paving the Road Towards European, European Regulation for AI Systems. It's my utmost pleasure to moderate this panel with great uh, participants. Um, and I am honored to be part of this um, virtual IGF. So um, I'll start by introducing myself really shortly, then introducing the participants, and then we'll move on to the substance, which is how exactly do we um, go towards a Europe a AI act within the European Union that is efficient, that works, that enable a trustworthy use of AI systems on the European market. Um, so my name is Iman Bello. I'm a, I'm a European Paris-based lawyer. I work on business ethics compliance and what kind of crime that includes cancelling in terms of policy and international human rights law. Um, I also lecture ethics and politics of AI systems at Sciences Po. I've been lecturing that class for about five years now. And it's my pleasure to moderate this panel um, <clears throat> with Nicholas, who's a senior researcher and lecturer at the Institute of Software Security at Hamburg University of Technology. Um, Patricia, who's a postdoc at the Fletcher School of Law and Diploma Center of University. Danielle, who works as the Europe Policy Analyst at Access Now Brussels office, um, as well as Claudio, who is the head of the International Office and Professor and former Dean of the Faculty of Law at Paraguay State University in Brazil. Um, so, Nicholas, you are, your research stands at the intersection of human-computer interaction and privacy engineering. Um, you are, if I understood correctly, particu particularly interested in the application of AI systems and digital nudging to cybersecurity decision-making processes. And you also hold a PhD in computer science. So you're here today with us to um, tell us about the technical perspective on the AI regulation. Thank you so much for joining. Um, Patricia, you're a postdoc at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Um, you're also a visiting fellow in the Information Society project at Yale Law School. And your research, again, if I understood correctly, focuses on the legal and policy frameworks for privacy protections and the use of metadata and, the, and technologies. Um, before, um, you also hold a PhD um, in, in Information Science and Technology from the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University, as well as a law degree um, from the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. And before, um, during your PhD, you also used to practice law. So you're also here today to tell us a little bit more about the international law perspective on the European AI regulation. Danielle, as I, as I mentioned before, um, you're the Europe Policy Analyst at Access Now's Brussels office. Um, you work on issues around AI systems and data protection with a focus on um, facial recognition biometrics, as well as augmented and virtual reality. Um, prior to working at Access Now, you used to be, you as a Mozilla Fellow, you developed AIMIF.org, um, and you also hold a PhD in philosophy um, from KU Leuven in Belgium. Claudio, you also hold a PhD. Um, you're the head of the international office, um, professor in Formidian of the Faculty of Law at Paraba State University. Um, you're also a researcher for the Portuguese Government Agency for Science and Technology, affiliated with the Research Center for the Future of Law from the Pontifical Catholic University of Portugal. Um, and you also hold a PhD from the Pontifical Catholic University of Portugal. Um, so let us start this session on paving the road for the European regulations on AI systems. I'll ask you some, some brief questions um, and hopefully if you can, you know, answer them in five minutes, that would be great. Then we can, you know, discuss among one another and then have some time for, for Q&A. I'm sure the audience will have 
um, interesting and delightful questions to ask to ask all of you. Um, so maybe you know um, on the draft regulation, it, it would be best to put the context in place. Um, we all know that the that the draft regulation, um, the first draft dates um, dates April 2020, 2021. Um, the objective of the of the proposal of the commission. Um, is to ensure that AI systems are placed on the union markets and used in the union are safe. Um, they respect existing laws on fundamental rights as well as union values. And the, the draft also aims at ensuring legal certainty in view of facilitating investment and innovation in AI systems, as well as ensuring effective, and I'm sure we'll discuss this, affecting enforcement of existing laws. Um, so, Maybe we could start with the definition of AI systems, not in general, but within the draft act. Um, Daniel, could you please tell us how the AI systems are defined within the act? Sure thing, yeah. Um, and just quickly, for those of you who may not know Access Now, we're a global human rights organization. Um, I, I'll start a little bit before the definition to give give the context for my own opinion on the on the definition. Um, when we heard that the commission wanted to propose a risk based approach to AI, um, we outlined some issues that we had with that because we thought that that would run into some potential problems. Um, one was that there, you know. In many risk-based approaches, there's an assumption that all risks can be mitigated. And so early in the process, we said, we need to take account of the fact that there could be some risks which cannot be mitigated. And so any regulation on AI would need to have um, the possibility for prohibitions. Um, thankfully, that does exist in the Act, and maybe we can come back to that because there's lots of questions about whether the prohibitions that are in there are actually effective or not. Um, but one of the other things that goes along with a risk-based approach is that you inevitably leave out many systems from the types of obligations so you know as opposed to gdpr which is you know grants rights uh to people who are going to be effective and this applies to you know um across the board if if you're only focusing on certain you know sectors of systems and certain systems that have sort of been predefined as high risk then you run this risk that th there will be other systems which also pose a, a threat which are left out. Um, and if the update mechanism for adding new systems is slow, then this can be a problem. Now, how does that relate to the definition? That relates to the definition because if you take a risk-based approach, um, I think it's quite clear that what you need to do is have a very broad definition of AI systems because what you're looking at in the risk-based approach is the impact um in certain use cases you know the the regulation focuses on use cases whether that's in policing whether that's in access to education um migration context what we really care about here is the impact that these systems can have on fundamental rights and what would be very very problematic is to have the risk-based approach which inherently only places obligations on a small set of systems and a narrow definition of AI, because then you would only focus on some very particular types of systems that do that thing. So if you're talking about uh, systems that control access to education, if you had a very narrow definition of AI that only, say, focused on machine learning, uh, you would leave out probably the majority of you know, software systems, computer systems that are being used to control access to education. And from a fundamental rights perspective, th there's little to no difference between using, you know, the most advanced deep learning system to do that thing and using a, a more rudimentary, uh, sorry about the uh, baby crying in the background, she's homesick from the crush. Um, yeah, there, there's no real difference there from a fundamental rights perspective and you know a lot of these obligations apply we want transparency we want you know all of these things to apply now there have been some uh movement uh yeah uh, just one minute okay um unfortunately we've seen some movement to call for a narrowing of the definition um i'm not sure if all of you've seen it but the slovenian presidency of the council 
published their first compromise text. Um, and they dare talk about and propose to, to narrow the definition down. We've also seen this from some lobby groups, um, which are you know, heavily funded by uh, people who would benefit from such a narrowing, um, calling for this. Now, we think it's, it's complete nonsense, one, for the reason that I said that it's, it makes no sense from a fundamental rights perspective. But, the, and this is the last thing I'll say, if you narrow the definition, you ne necessarily narrow it upwards in complexity. You're not going to narrow it downwards and exclude machine learning. Now, if you narrow it up to more complex systems, you will totally undermine one of the pillars and aims of the regulation, which is to promote AI innovation, because you would place obligations on cutting edge systems and not place them on more simple ones. So I think from the commissions and the council parliament perspective, narrowing the definition upwards in complexity, which is the only way you could narrow it, I think, uh, would undermine both aims of the regulation to protect fundamental rights and to promote an uh, ecosystem of uh, trust and excellence around AI developed. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so if, you know, narrowing the definition is such an issue, um, but discussing the risk-based approach um, that the draft um, has been taken, would you say, Nicholas, that um, there are some challenges in, in the way, you know, um, we assess risk that could be posed by AI systems? Yeah, definitely. So uh, thank you very much first to all of you for joining the panel. And uh, I'm really happy to engage in this discussion with you. And thank you, Ivan, for moderating. Uh, so when I first saw the uh, that the regulation draft was embracing a risk-driven approach, I felt uh, somehow relieved because I work in risk management. Uh, and uh, and I think risk assessment play a key role in building AI trustworthiness. And uh, so users should be, I, this is my personal belief, that users should be aware of the risks of using certain and AI systems, their purpose, and of course, their limitations. Um, so then I saw the categories that were proposed, um, meaning the unacceptable risks, high risk, limited, and minimal risk. And, and I became a little bit skeptical. Um, so my major concern is that uh, some AI applications, and I think this has been uh, shown throughout the recent history, uh, that might seem harmless, uh, at the beginning might end up introducing risks. So for example, news recommender systems. We have seen how misinformation can jeopardize democracies over the last last years. We saw it during the Brexit referendum. We saw it during the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw it in the 2016 US election. So, um, and my question uh, immediately triggers, uh, who would have thought that a simple AI-based recommender system uh, might end up turning upside down our democratic foundations? So um, how could we have imagined that it was ended up spreading the hate and doubt? Um, so these are uh, defined in within the current literature as the uh, backfire effects of uh, AI systems. And uh, in, term of, in terms of risk assessment, uh, the risk uh, community is still at its infancy when it comes to backfire effects. Um, I think that uh, as Daniel very, uh, very well had summarized, um, this is or the spirit of this uh, risk assessment approach is based on the uh, on case studies and uh, of course some case studies are more trivial than other case studies um, and uh, and I also would add that um, the case studies that are proposed or treated or seemly discussed and within the regulation are very much centered on the individual harms, so harms for individuals and not on a collective basis. So I really think that the problem or the major problem with AI is that can have a very deep impact on society at large. And this is why I think that this uh, human rights impact assessment, it's really crucial. The problem is that in the community, I have the feeling that we are not even ready for conducting that in a proper way. And, uh, and this was actually from a, from, um, and from a technical perspective, as an, as an engineer, as a computer scientist, I was wondering, oh, okay, we are completely uh, against the wall because we have to act now and we don't have, uh, we don't have much resources for, for conducting this. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, and we have seen it, uh, we have seen something similar happening with the uh, 
data protection impact assessment within uh, the, um, the GDPR, right? So um, when, uh, when I had to uh, work in a project that was uh, intended to provide engineers with a toolkit and frameworks for conducting a data protection impact assessment, we had a very intense discussion about definitions actually. And, um, and to actually, um, how can I say, um, find a common ground between what the uh, regulation was saying, what the uh, actually what the engineers was were looking forward to have as instrument for conducting a data protection impact assessment was extremely challenging. So we even found ourselves running in circles and, uh, and my I would say my this is maybe where my my major concerns within this uh, regulation draft will uh, come into place. So I really think that uh, this is going to be challenged. Thank you so much, Nicholas. So we have a challenge in terms of scope, um, defining a systems, making sure that all applications are embedded within the regulation and therefore that all impacts can be taken into account. We have another challenge regarding um, the risk assessment difficulty um, from the technical from the technical community. Um, how exactly in term, practically um, will those risk assessments actually take place, even though they are crucial? Um, also to take into account individual but also collective consequences of AI systems. Um, Claudio, do you do you foresee other um, you know challenging or surprising aspects to the AI Act as it is drafted now? Uh, thank you very much, Imani, for the opportunity. Good morning, you all. Uh, I, I think I'd like to, to uh, build that question on the aspect that Danny has first raised, which is the pro prohibition. It's not a surprising issue, but I think it's a necessary. Uh, if you're taking a risk-based approach, it is necessary to draw red lines. I was very much skeptical if, I, if we would see those red lines, because if we take on uh, the money from the last, let's say, let's uh, powerful regulatory wave, which was the GDPR about data protection, we do not see a prohibition as such. We do have one, let's say, stronger uh, take on prohibition, which is on special categories of data. The world prohibit, semantically speaking, the world prohibition is, is there with 10 large widespread exceptions. So it's not exactly, it's not, you don't, you don't, legally speaking, you don't have a strong prohibition if you have 10 exceptions for that. But then uh, when we take uh, the, the, the EI uh, re uh, regulation proposal from the EU, there is a title uh, named after, constructed around a, a prohibition. Uh, they are uh, somewhat stronger, they are uh, generally construed, which is what I mean, which we where, where we see space, uh, and that conveys a message that we do understand there are limits that are not to be passed as of now, and that's interesting. Uh, the the fourth prohibition, which is the the, the one that uh, refers to uh, wide uh, surveillance in open, in open spaces, it has. Uh, exceptions that are comprehensible in the context where, where they are. Uh, but it's interesting to see, and ma maybe if we're looking for a standard that spreads globally, which was the case with the last regulatory uh, wave, that, that uh, sends a, a good message that there are red lines that we're, we, we, do not, we cannot cross, uh, because as Daniel said, there are risks when we deal with AI, that because of what Nico said, the widespread effects that cannot be mitigated, and I think that is not uh, that, that 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 is the take I, I would I would highlight from here as a as a surprising one. We do not have, I repeat, we do not currently have in many of the uh, of the legislative initiatives that we have around the world express prohibitions, and the fact that we have them now. Uh, sends a good message that we don't understand yet the, the impact, the full extent of the impact of, of those technologies, and we are to admit red lights which are not to be crossed. Thank you so much. Okay, it's interesting because we've just started the discussion, but where we already are drawing key elements from the draft, uh, which are you know implementation 
um, within the AI value chain from the technical community um, definition in terms of policy, how do we ensure that the draft actually has the impact that we would want it to have? Um, and then in terms of prohibition as well, where do we choose to draw the line in terms of what is feasible, but what should, but what should be happening on the ground um, or not? And also because, you know, the, the very aim of the, of, the, of the AI Act is also to ensure that union values are respected. It's also clear, clearly important to, to see whether or not and where we choose to draw the line. Um, Patricia, so, you know, when we, when we look at the pipeline of, um, you know, the creation of AI systems, we start, we start with people um, that are transformed um, in data um, that is processed. Um, and then at the end of that pipeline, in terms of AI value chain, we have the algorithm, which is most of the time the end point of the whole process. Um, going towards, you know, other, um, other body of laws, Patricia, could you maybe, you know, give us some elements um, as to what provisions in international human rights law um, could be helpful, could be used in terms of algorithmic accountability for that very end of, um, you know, AI, AI creation, so to say. Yes, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Good morning for me and <laughs> whatever for the rest of you, wherever you are. Well, in terms of, um, I'm going to take you a little bit out of the European regulatory new framework to talk a little to talk a little bit about in terms of human rights law. So, in terms of human rights law related to algorithmic accountability, I'm going to be very brief. First, I will talk about international human rights law, then about international law. And um, hopefully if we have some time, we can touch a little bit on what has been done within the US legislation, just on purposes of comparison. So from an international human rights law per perspective, um, um, in terms of algorithmic accountability, this international framework may be helpful from three aspects. First, it can be helpful classifying the distinct uh, responsibilities of the different actors through the algorithmic life cycle and in such condition, uh, it can help to define the harm in a more precise way than, than just the, uh, the claiming of the existence of a bias. It also can impose obligations on governments, governments on acting on behalf of their nation states, and down on the road, can help to set up some expectations over the private sector, which, are, which is for the most part, the ones who develop and handle the artificial intelligence technology. Why do I say there are obligations on one and expectations on another? Because, uh, well, as we know, the international law is the law of the nation states. And the nation states that commit to follow these uh, international provisions, can, um, can establish some national statutes that, are, that can be enforced to, over the private sector. That's why I say it's obligations for one and potentially expectations over the other one. The third point, is, which the international uh, human rights law can be helpful, is by integrating an accountability framework. The international human rights law has tools that have been tested over the years, over decades, which, which after a lot of the development have become very helpful in establishing responsibility and liability. Now, from the international law point of view, which is different, we have three variables that, um, that uh, have some implications over the way that the international law has been handled. As we know, AI, has brought a lot uh, of changes to our life. Yet international law is the value of law most resistant to change. Why? Because it's based on the powerful Westphalian model of the nation state. So the first element that we need to take into consideration is related to automatization, um, in particular to autonomous weapon systems. What the issue here is ensuring the limits of the, meaning, the meaningful human control over autonomous systems, but the main challenge lies in the use of artificial intelligence and algorithms. 
Second, and probably the most important one, is the establishment of a liable entity. You know, in international law, it's clear what a human is, what a nation state is, what an international organization is. But when we talk about uh, um, an artificial intelligence entity, the international law is empty. What is the level of its responsibility? How should it be addressed? How is it liable? It is for the to, to kind of solve in this situation, it, uh, academics uh, have established that it's necessary to examine what the national bodies have to say about these uh, artificial intelligent entities. The problem, of course, is that most likely we are going to have, we are inevitably, inevitably going to end, it, end up having a clash of jurisdiction, which is the eternal unsolved problem of international law. Now, why is this important? Because the degree of responsibility is different when these entities take decisions on their own uh, or, uh, or it is different than when they are controlled by a human who can actually be held liable under international law or under national law. And the final aspect is the attribution, right? When are uh, the instructions sufficiently precise to warrant attribution? In international criminal law, only humans are involved, right? Because humans are liable. Humans can be, uh, can be, in, can be indicted and declared guilty. While when an, uh, when an artificial intelligence entity is involved, then we have humans interacting with a machine. The situation, it's, it's complicated, not also because uh, it's not clear to what extent humans can be actually set liable, but also this, but also because uh, it's very likely, and we will see this, that humans ended up executing a decision that has been taken by a machine or by an artificial intelligence system. Thank you. Um, thank you. Of course, so there's this, there's this dichotomy um, that, that we hear a lot um, between human supporting, um, sorry, machine supporting, deci decision supporting systems and um, decision making systems. And most of the time we've seen, we've read the papers um, that tell us that even when systems are decision supporting, um, humans tend to follow um, the advice that has been given um, by, by the system. And therefore it's difficult to answer these legal questions of liability. Um, so we've, in terms of you know scope, we've seen um, that there are systems. So we we've understood that there's an issue with definition. Um, there's a, there's this risk based approach, um, and then there are systems that are prohibited. And then there's the question. There's the issue of liability, and then there's also the issue of harms. Um, how do we ensure that um, a um, the act is that is really enforced and that it's implemented and that the risk approach the risk approach is respected, and therefore before any harms happen, those are mitigated, the risks are mitigated. And then when the risks do happen, when they transform themselves into harms, um, are they or are they not? Um, um, I'm sure we'll discuss this, um, taking into account and are um, affected persons um, afforded ways to, to find remedy. Um, Nicholas, maybe to start this discussion before we discuss you know, the consequences of AI system, let us take first to um, when they are created and um, when the risk-based approach is um, taken into account. What issue do you foresee in terms of um, implementations, you know? <clears throat> yeah, and thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of implementation, it's, uh, it's quite related to what I exposed um, earlier at, uh, at the beginning of the panel. Is that we need instruments that would help the developers of AI systems to assess the risks of whatever they're creating. Um, of course, the, um, having some use cases as a guideline, it's, uh, it's quite uh, promising, or at least it's, it's better than nothing, I would put it in, 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 in some way. Um, but, um, but as I said, uh, assessing the impact that these systems might have at large, it's quite uh, it's quite difficult because we basically see the negative consequence after quite a, quite a long time. Um, if I uh, rem if I remember correctly, the uh, the the um, the draft includes. Uh, 
or at least uh, suggest that AI systems of high risk should be monitored on the runs. So one should uh, constantly monitor that the, that the, um, that the goal that they uh, are pursuing is actually uh, not being, um, how to say, yeah, not being uh, provoking any harm or not, uh, or it's, it's actually on, on its on its uh, right course of uh, course of action. Um, still, uh, they propose it only for the high risk uh, AI um, AI systems and not for not for the other ones. So, and I, I'm quite uh, I'm quite wondering why. I think we should monitor any AI systems because bug fire effects can happen at any level, and. Um, uh, so that's on that's on the on on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think uh, on or what I have uh, what I have the, um, my experience with the uh, data protection impact assessment with the GDPR was that um, some developers, when we were uh, actually conducting experiments and uh, we, we were giving them a method and we were giving them some guidelines for conducting a data protection impact assessment, and they were. They had like a quite interesting interpretation of what risks were. So, for example, they were telling me, "Oh, okay, the risks of not having a consent form. Um, no, this is not a risk with the GDPR. You must have a consent form. So, you should focus on the user. What could happen with the user? Which negative consequences might uh, this person this person suffer? Which are the human rights threats or the threats in terms of human rights? And thinking in this way." I find it, uh, I, I have seen that it's quite hard for average developers, maybe because they are, they're, um, they are training in ethics, it's not, uh, not so, uh, not so high. Uh, but I think that this is something, this kind of like implicit culture, we are, we are fighting against that. And I think we should be aware of that. So I think that, uh, that having this, uh, having said that, um, we need to keep in mind that uh we, we we might have the best draft we might have a really uh, interesting approach but in the end in the implementation in the practice there are some forces that uh, we will we will have to find against against with inevitably thank you that's very clear um it's very interesting that you mentioned that in order to better assess the risk um a method could be to focus on the user um, Danielle, maybe you would like to react to this, um, to the questions of whether or not um, the draft as it is um, focuses on the user um, or, or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, and just for people who are maybe not totally familiar with the terminology of the act, it specifies two actors, the provider, which is kind of the developer, the company developing the system, and then the user is not the, the person affected by it, but the entity that wants to deploy the system. So if you had a facial recognition system, maybe the provider is Microsoft, Clearview AI, someone like this, um, and the user could be uh, an individual police department, a local council, something like that. So yeah, exactly. I think um, one of the big issues with the act as it is, is that um, there are not enough obligations on users relative to providers. Now, I don't think there should be fewer uh, obligations on providers, but we, we should have additional obligations on users precisely because of like what Nicholas was saying, can, are the developers really the best place to assess all of the risks to fundamental rights? Obviously there are some, some risks to fundamental rights occur at the design stage based on the types of training data, you know, and, and are foreseeable. But what we know is that it's really the context in which you deploy a system that's going to create a lot of risk. And actually, the entity that is deciding we need an AI system, we're going to deploy it for this objective, is the entity that should be assessing the risk to fundamental rights. So what we're actually asking for, and I can maybe share a link if I can do that in the chat with everyone. Um, Access Now, European Digital Rights, Algorithm Watch, and 116 civil society organizations have published a position um, asking for changes to the act. And one of the things we're asking for is more obligations on users. And more concretely, we're asking for users of high-risk AI systems, so the entities that decides to deploy a high-risk AI system, procure it, to do a human rights impact assessment. Um, we have a list of things that we want in that, but one of the things that we want them to do 
is to identify affected groups. Um, we also want, at the moment, some of you may know, and it's one of the most interesting things in the Act, there's in Article 60 proposes a, a database, so a publicly viewable database of all high-risk AI systems that are on the market in the EU. So that only focuses on providers. We would just know that Clearview AI sell facial recognition in the EU. We think that that needs to be extended to use. We need to know where these systems are in use. Um, so users should also have to register their use of a high-risk AI system there. What that would do is it would give people the opportunity to know my local police department is using the system, my local council is using, or my university is using the system. There's also, if you combine that with the idea that the user has had to identify affected groups, you actually create the possibility of a rights holder within the act. And then we, we want, you know, we can get into this maybe later. Um, additional rights to be accorded to the affected people, as well as the ability to contest whether you're affected or not, because as Nicholas pointed out, it's not always such a clear individual effect. Um, there's often externalities to how these systems operate. And, you know, we need this transparency to make up for exactly the deficiencies that Nicholas pointed out. You can't assess all the risks in advance. Um, and we need to have that base level transparency, what's being used, what's the intention, who's potentially affected to, you know, allow civil society, affected communities uh, and different people to contribute, to point out, no, here's a risk. Um, so, you know, the, these different elements, I think, coming together, if we can add these to the act throughout the legislative process now, I think we can make it a much more effective instrument. Thank you. Um, again, very clear. So we have this we have this um, difficulty around the implementation when it is about assessing risk at the development stage. And then we have another difficulty in terms of assessing risk later in life in the, con in the context in which the AI system is being deployed. Um, and that difficulty um, touches upon um, not only users uh, in terms of entities that use and deploy the systems that have been created by others, by providers, but also end users. Um, uh, in other words, people. Um, and sometimes those persons, they become affected persons, um, which means that they are affected um, pervasively in a, in a negative sense um, by the AI systems that have been deployed and used. Um, maybe so, Claudio, if we take a concrete example of a AI system, of, of sorry, of a method and a, and a, and a, and a tool um, that, that we all know of, um, the facial recognition, if we discuss this for a bit, um, what would you say about the way the AI Act that is drafted now and treats um, facial recognition systems. Uh, thank you again, Imani. Let me just uh, give you a temperature of the development of the issue to contextualize what Daniel and, and, and Nico have, have put here. As of now, the Council of Europe, as of today, the Council of Europe uh, maps 506 regulatory and uh, slash governance initiatives uh, concerning an AI regulation or governance, and, and it does not even map all of them, all the initiatives that there are uh, out there. For example, we have a Brazilian uh, bill which, is, which has passed the, the, the Senate and is going through Congress now, uh, which is not mapped there. It is, it, I, I believe it doesn't have the, the, the level of maturity to be considered as, a, as an initiative. Uh, let's assume that many of those in initiatives, many of them are proposed in good faith by governments or, or by multi-stakeholder uh, arrangements or by uh, legislative houses. Uh, each of them might have a model to assess risk, because I think the risk assessment base is in itself a good approach. The problem is nobody has put together a framework to assess risk to, or to assess general post risks for systems that automate important aspects of our land. So we do, that's interesting because we do, for cybersecurity, which is a little bit more, uh, let's say, an established area of human uh, uh, action, we do have a set of, of precise uh, aspects that we consider when we are going to assess risks. We have never done such thing for an automation system that, uh, that automates an important aspects of our life as Daniel uh, mentions. And then some of those aspects 
are not there. Risk assessments have, have become the only, the, 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 let's say the most appropriate tool for us uh, to face new technologies. But as they have, uh, from my perspective, as they have come into the digital realm, helping us do so from data protection up to now, we're dealing with them for very little time. We, we are not very sure. We're not very, there's no uh, general standard on how to uh, uh, conduct that. Cases like the off call uh, in, in the UK, which is not really a, a, a fully automation system, but they clearly show that when uh, more stakeholders are heard in an issue, there's more likely for us to understand that there is a risk that was not there when people in good faith design the system. So transparency lies uh, uh, on the basis of all these discussions. Uh, and I'm not saying about, uh, I'm, not, I'm not mentioning transparency to address the explainability dilemma, which is something that uh, has been, has, has been, uh, has, to be considered within a technical context. I'm saying about the transparency of what we're using the system, things that we can clearly describe in human language. We are using systems to help us achieve that task. You're, you're a public service, you're a private company, we're using that. I understand there are trade secrets, there are economic uh, interests that are legitimate and have to be protected, but if we're, if we will to tap into the advantages, and I do believe that automation may bring us uh, some advantages, may make us scale some degree of equality that otherwise would not be possible without these tools, we have to start from the basis of transparency. Curiously enough, transparency is also the basis for any legitimate and, and healthy use of data. And having said that for the last minute, there is no, uh, I believe the community does not have any opposition to the facial recognition technology. As such, the issues that, the issues that is that the examples, the instances that we have show that they work very poorly, very poorly, and they may cause a lot of uh, uh, damage in spite of the fact, uh, despite of the fact that they're, they're, when we, we talk about facial uh, recognition technology, even if, even if you talk about face detection, which does not exactly uh, process personal data, but has been the object of a judicial decision, uh, judicial decision here in Brazil, even if we're not touching on the personal data uh, aspect, uh, they pose risk because it touches upon a very, very sensitive data and it works very poorly. So again, it's a, it's a matter of uh, us trying to find a more global and meaningful way to assess risks uh, and to assess risk in a way that makes the technology uh, really usable, usable in a, in, a, in a concrete case. Thank you. Um, so obviously this, this question of transparency um, is related to the, to the question of trustworthiness. If you, if you don't know what we're discussing, um, it's hard to trust. Um, I wouldn't say, if I may, um, that, so, how do I put this? Obviously, um, facial recognition systems, they don't really work, especially in people of color. Um, but before we ask the questions of whether, we, whether they work or not, it's also important to take a step back and ask whether we want them to be put, you know, in the public space or not. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a foundation on, on whether or not citizens agree um, about facial recognition systems. Um, it's not solely about their the performance, the effectiveness. If we make the discussion about the effectiveness and performance, we forget to ask. And obviously this is an open discussion, so I'm asking all of you, and I don't know if any of you, uh, maybe Patricia or someone else wants to react to this, um, but it's not, so it's not solely about performance effectiveness, but it's also about whether or not we want them um, in our public space. And as you said, very rightfully, uh, Claudio, because of the data that they use, um, those are systems that that's, per se, I would say, um, have some risk or transfer some risk uh, in themselves. Maybe Daniel really shortly, and then we'll move on um, to, because I, so Claudio, really briefly, Claudio mentioned um, this lack of global, um, global standard, global set of rules that would be practical. Also, also, you know, related to what Nicholas was saying, um, and that is a rules or, 
practical roles, translation, translational roles um, for the technical community. Um, I'd like to, I'd like us to take a step back and see whether or not we could learn um, from our U.S. Um, I was about to say neighbors, not so much, but um, about our U.S. Um, counterparts. So maybe Daniel, really briefly on fashion recognition, sure. and just then very, on. very quick on fashion recognition. Totally to really just plus one what you said there, Imane, and um, I, you know, from the start we've been saying it's bad when they don't work well, but you you also don't want to perfect instruments of surveillance. And actually, a perfectly accurate facial recognition system in operation in our public spaces is just incompatible with fundamental rights for us. The other thing just to say is it's not all about live facial recognition. All of the focus seems to have gone on to live facial recognition, but what's called in the act post remote biometric identification is equally, if not more harmful in some cases. Um, take investigative journalists, say a journalist publishes a huge expose that implicates government figures, law enforcement, um, they could then go back through footage, CCTV footage, other types of footage, find out who that journalist spoke to, identify their sources. Um, and this is a, a threat from post remote biometric identification, not live. So the idea that there's this kind of live is the worst is, is completely unfounded. Um, and we think that both types need to be fully prohibited in our public spaces. And then, you know, as was mentioned with facial detection, things like this, they need to be we need to ensure that they work well. The ones that are not going to be prohibited need to be uh, classified as, as high risk so that we we're sure that they, they work properly. Thank you. Um, so, so far we've seen that um, there's a pitfall in having an horizontal regulation in which the definition, um, because it is horizontal, isn't clear, and therefore uh, the impact of the draft um, could not be as high as we would want it to be. Um, we've also seen there's, there's an issue with implementation, um, especially at the development stage, um, because there's A, this given culture within the technical community, and also B, um, lack, of, um, lack of training maybe uh, in ethics, both human rights and risk assessment methodology um, to really assess risk. There's also this issue of which risk should be assessed and related to which systems, so the high risk or all of them. And we've also seen that, in order, that as Claudio was saying earlier, in order to ensure transparency, um, which is really crucial, we also need to know, and that's related to what Daniel used to say, um, <clears throat> we need to make sure that we know um, as end users <clears throat> which systems are used, for which purposes, and where. <clears throat> so maybe moving on to, you know, how do we pave the European regulation moving onwards? Um, is there anything we could learn um, from the approach of the United States on the subject? What would you say, Patricia? Well, the problem with the United States is that a lot happens, but at the end, nothing happens. So um, <laughs> what do I mean by this is the U.S. Uh, follows, um, has a federal, federal system. What do I mean by this? The country lacks a federal mandate to regulate AI as a country. But yet, there are multiple state legislations on the subject, and there are multiple attempts and proposals to regulate AI within Congress. So um, general artificial intelligence bills or resolutions were introduced in at least 17 states in 2000, 2021 and 13 in 2020, just in the last two years. Right? And it, uh, this legislation has been enacted in at least five states, different in all of them. The main purpose to address, or the main points they try to address, is the creation of the creation of agencies that are supposed to advise the authorities about re the risks of AI. Some of these statutes or proposals take particular interest in protecting children. Is the prohibition of using predictive models that use algorithms in a way that unfairly discriminate ba uh, discriminate based on race, color, and national or ethical or ethnic origin, religion, gender, disability, and data privacy. In particular, there is a lot of discussion about facial recognition. Um, it has been acknowledged and accepted into some state legislations, but it's under constant questioning because of privacy concerns, very similar to the one that uh, Daniel just mentioned. 
plus the police is constantly accused of overusing them and of lacking the proper training to handle these systems. Now, in the side of the executive branch, um, well, the White House this year in July, uh, um, specifically um, uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the National Science Foundations, two agencies under the US government, announced what is called the newly formed National Artificial Intelligence Research Resource Task Force which uh, is supposed to write the roadmap for expanding access to critical resources and educational tools that are supposed to increase uh, to spur AI innovation and economic prosperity. Now, the task force is supposed to provide recommendation, including technical capabilities, governance, administration, and assessment as well as requirement for security, privacy, civil, civil rights, and civil liberties. Uh, that's one attempt on the side of the executive branch. And now in July, like a couple of months after, another agency within the US government, this is the US Department of Commerce National Institute of Standard of Te and Technology, it's known as the NIST, inform about the development of what is called the AI risk management guidance. The main goal of this guidance is supposed to be to help technology developers, users, and evaluators to improve the trustworthiness of the AI systems and make the new AI technologies more competitive in the marketplace. The mandate of the NIST, which is different from the, from the White House, seems to be more oriented to analyze similar variables to the ones contained in the new European regulation. So that's something that we will need to be pay attention on when they produce a report or whatever outcome they decide. But they are not there yet, of course. This is a newly initiative from July of this year. Now, this is at the side of the executive and the local, and the local states, but the Congress also is going through its own path, right? The Congress is unfortunately particularly interested in using AI for military purposes. They are highly focused in intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and to some extent, deep fakes, semi-autonomous and autonomous vehicles, and a lot about lethal autonomous weapon systems. There have been multiple bills within the last two um, periods of work of the Senate, and none of them has been enacted. And up to this point, it is not clear whether a final agreement will be achieved or no. And what happens is the, in the US, it's, it's kind of what we always see in, the, in this dichotomy between the US and Europe. Europe tends to regulate while the US tends to not regulate. So at some point, as I mentioned when I was talking about the international law, if the US is able to achieve, to, to, to consolidate a statue, a federal statue, at some point we are going to see a, class of, a clash of jurisdictions and well up to that point, and a final outcome is very difficult to foresee. Thank you, that's very interesting. Um, to me, that raises two different set of questions. Um, the first one is related to the prohibitions, um, and maybe I'd like to hear from Daniel on that. And then the second set of questions you raises, and maybe um, Claudio, you wanna react to this, is how do we foresee, if foreseeable, obviously, how do we foresee um, the impact in terms of jurisdiction that the AI Act could have? Will it, for instance, just like the GDPR did, um, set a global standard um, and be applied uh, within other jurisdictions, even though the, the, its scope is limited to the European Union? So maybe on um, prohibitions that are currently um, um, uh, currently written within the within the Act, Daniel. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so we've already talked about the one on remote biometric identification and very quickly. I mean, we, we would delete 
the exceptions um, also delete the word real time and have a prohibition on remote biometric identification in publicly accessible spaces. We think that's the only way that it can be done to protect fundamental rights. The, you've then got three other prohibitions, which are quite badly phrased. I will say that in the most recent um, text from the Slovenian presidency, they have been improved significantly. Um, so there was some strange definitions about, you know, a, a subliminal manipulation of people that could be proven to cause psychological or physical harm. And that, that's kind of silly because if you're subliminally manipulating someone to do things against their will, that's enough. That's bad. <laughs> like that that should be prohibited. It doesn't matter if it causes them harm. Like subliminal manipulation for our own benefit is also not uh, fundamental rights compliant. Um, beyond the, the four that are there, um, you know, civil society has collectively called for additional prohibitions um, on some uses of predictive policing, uh, particularly problematic ones. Uh, emotion recognition as well, we think in, and this was backed up by the European Data Protection Supervisor and Data Protection Board in their opinion that, um, yeah, they also believe that AI systems which purport to detect our emotions, uh, lie detectors, AI lie detectors should also be prohibited. Um, but the, the meta point I'd like to make is that the list of high risk systems in the AI Act can be updated. There's a mechanism to do that. There isn't one to update the list of prohibitions, and th that seems like hubris to me. It's it's very short sighted. The idea that you know they've, the Commission has acknowledged that some systems pose an unacceptable risk to fundamental rights, but claim simultaneously to have you know captured them all with those four, and and that doesn't make sense. Um, so there needs to be a mechanism to allow for an update modifications of Article 5. We can discuss what that mechanism should be, but it's pretty clear that the regulation will not be future-proofed if it doesn't have that. Thank you. So if we combine what uh, you were saying and what Nicholas was saying earlier, um, we have only high-risk systems um, whose impact needs to be um, assessed and, and on, on the run in the short and long, long run but not, not over, other iris are not taken into account. So their impacts are, it's a one-time risk assessment, even though their impact might change over time. That's the one pitfall. And then we have um, the fact that it's solely the high risk list that can be updated, but not the list of prohibitions. So independently, if I understand correctly, independently from the consequences, it doesn't really move. Okay. Um, Interesting, thank you. Um, maybe Claudio really shortly, and then we'll try to take some questions from the audience if we can. Um, Claudio, do you want to react to what Patricia was saying earlier, um, notably, uh, notably about the you know the future clash of jurisdiction um, based on the current current US approach? Um, would you say that just like the GDPR did, we've seen you know for instance we've seen big uh, digital companies just you know. <clears throat> Um, uh, applying the GDPR standards for all of their end users independently from where they from where they were situated, would you say that the scope of the AI Act has a chance um, to do the same? Uh, I, I do think we have a fairly good starting point, and it's a, a, a let's say the, the structure is is very rich. Not not every not every single decision in the text is, is well taken. Uh, and it surely sends, as I said, sends a, me a message to the rest of the world that, uh, 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 let's say, a far-reaching uh, universal framework for, for regulating or managing or governing AI within a certain jurisdiction is, is somewhat possible. This goes, uh, in, in the past years, we were very much looking at issues of, uh, of, of sector industry uh, approaches. <laughs> we talked very much about uh, different frameworks being required to answer to automa uh, automation issues in, 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 uh, in the country. So there was, for example, uh, uh, an, an initiative or a thought uh, so as to address education or as to address health and perhaps public uses of, of uh, automation. And I think having a, having a standard as the proposal might be an interesting uh, an interesting development. What we don't have anymore 
is the uh, is the leadership position of that GDPR represented. I mean, uh, that was when, when we had uh, the GDPR as a as a global standard. Uh, there were not uh, 506 ongoing in initiatives, 506 uh, initiatives of gov for governing or for, for legislation. And I think we do have other now, because of GDPR also represented a geopolitical landmark. It was like European values guiding the development of, of data protection throughout the world. Uh, and it is uh, strategic. But I think AI represents a much more strategic uh, issue in the world. So we have, for example, China clearly reacting with a very uh, different approach from the one in the EU regulation for, for AI. Uh, China does not base its approach on, on algorithmic, on, uh, sorry, risk. It's not a risk-based approach. It's a, it's, it's a, a provision to address recommendation systems in general so it's it's let's say it's used much, clearly used in in our everyday tools it that curiously enough it does address user needs uh, we're now of course there are issues of implementation how the country and and the political culture and then the legal culture will implement that there's no we cannot be naive about that but it does address user needs uh, it does address uh, the, the fact that the users can, can more actively interact with these platforms and demand remedy, which is not present, currently present in the text, uh, in the European text. And uh, so I think we, we have a good starting point. There is a possibility that it, it will represent again uh, a standard, but it's not alone anymore. It's not alone on the race anymore. There are other other uh, initiatives that are uh, have to be considered uh, at, at this point, and uh, the developments as of now, it's, it's a bit difficult to foresee. Thank you. Um, very interesting and very clear as well in terms of putting you know the draft within a geopolitical context. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that um, we've discussed it a bit earlier that right now as the draft is um, written, there are no remedy for end users. Um, maybe, Danielle, you want to react really shortly to this? And I was wondering if later we have uh, maybe five or 10 minutes for questions. So if you do have questions, don't hesitate to write them in the chat. I'll read through them um, and then we'll, you know, we'll discuss together. So Danielle, really shortly and the question of remedy uh, for end users. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really lacking in the, in the current draft and a lot of people immediately pointed out to this, that, you know, rights are not conferred on affected people and users, whatever you want to call them in the draft. I, I think there is a technical issue in that who would be the rights holder under the act, um, you know, in the GDPR, it's the data subject, but it can't just be anyone under under the act. So, as I mentioned, what, what we've proposed is if if you have the obligation on users to identify affected people, then the people identified as affected people could be rights holders um, under the act. So those two things I think have to go together. But yeah, we, we have a proposal which, which I linked to um, provide both redress in the case um, that something has gone wrong. Also, I, I think um, an interesting one to look at is rights, uh, the right not to be um, subjected to prohibited AI practice. Because although there are prohibitions there, it's going to be clear that companies are going to say, we're, we're not subliminally manipulating you. And you'll have to then prove actually what you're doing does fulfill this definition of a prohibition. So I do think we need to think about the enforcement of the prohibited practices to just avoid the situation where, yeah, someone just says that that's not what we're doing. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so... We've been asked to wrap it up. Um, maybe, just, you know, as a conclusion, Nicholas, um, could you tell us what you see? Uh, you know, how you, how you think we can you know, pave the way forward towards, um, you know, paving the roads for European regulation on AI systems. So um, thank you very much. It, the discussion has been very, very interesting and very, very engaging. Um, maybe as a take home message or what this panel is uh, actually exposing is that this will take once again, a lot of interdisciplinary work and very hard work. Uh, 
Um, and I think uh, we should take into account uh, all the different uh, fronts that, uh, that converge within the AI ecosystem and all the different stakeholders. And we have to um, be aware that uh, mainly, as you mentioned, Imana, earlier, developers are quite effectiveness and performance driven. And many of them, they are not properly trained in AI ethics or any kind of uh, human rights impact assessment. We have to provide uh, the means for uh, conducting that um, on the on the front line of AI development. Uh, I think this will be uh, at least for me the main uh, the main focus also for my research within the, the, the next years and uh, and hopefully we could all um, join forces into uh, for creating uh, this uh, trustworthy AI ecosystem that we all want and being able to uh, with more awareness, of the risks of uh, using and deploying AI systems, make use of them in a wiser way. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you all for joining us today. It was my utmost pleasure to moderate. Um, and we'll see you soon around the corner of AI governance. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye.